This video I'm going to do with alkanes and alkenes. There are four homologous series, uh, families if you like. I want you to think of homologous series as families of chemicals that have similar properties. And the four families, the four homologous series you need are alkanes, alkenes, alcohols and carboxylic acids. This video I'm hoping to do with both alkanes and alkenes uh, in one go. So let's get started. First, you need to be able to define what we mean by a homologous series. And there's two points you must mention in any definition. Point one is that you need to say they have similar reactions. The way to say that they have similar reactions is to say similar chemical properties. That's that one there. Similar chemical properties. Now, some people say that same point in a different way by saying the same functional group. Now, the functional group of any molecule is the bit of the molecule that's responsible for its characteristic reactions. So the functional groups in one homologous series are all the same because the functional group determines how it reacts and the reactions are very similar. Do not say both of those thinking you're going to get two marks. They're not. They're, they're just one mark because it's one point. So you need one of those two. Then the second thing you need to say is that, well, this is a series that has a trend in physical properties. So trend in physical properties this one, the blue one, you need to say that. And another way of saying that is they've got the same general formula. So don't say both of those blue points. You need one red point, one blue point, and together you get two points in an exam for homologous series. I would say to you that you should learn the definition homologous series is a series with similar chemical properties and a trend in physical properties and that would give you one each one each of those marks um, and as we get into this topic the alkanes uh, as our first homologous series then we're going to start naming the chemicals that are within it and the naming I want you to learn these things so when we have molecules with one carbon they begin, the names of them begin with meth. Meth stands for one carbon. Eth then stands for two carbons. Prope stands for three carbons. Bute for four carbons. Pent for five carbons. Hex for six carbons. Hept for seven carbons. Oct for eight carbons and so on. There is a whole system of numbering like that. But at GCSE, I think you need to, I would learn the first five meth, eth, pro, bute and pent to represent however many carbons you've got per molecule. So, to start the first homologous series, alkanes. Alkanes have a general formula, CMH2N plus 2. Let's take this here, methane. Methane, one carbon, four hydrogens. If N is one, CN would be C1, H, 2N plus 2. Double it, add 2. So if N is 1, double that 2 is 2, add 2, 4. CH4. CH4 gives you methane, CH4. If N is 2, then we get C2H6. C2H6 is ethane. C3H8 is propane. C4H10 is butane, C5H12 is pentane, and so on. The pattern is CNH2N plus 2. That there is the general formula for an alkane. Alkanes, can you see, they have carbon chains, and for every carbon, they've got two hydrogens. So that's the CH where the H is double the C, CNH2N. But then you've got these two hydrogens at the end. 
The two hydrogen at the, at the end are the plus two. So Cn H2n plus 2 is the general formula of alkanes and with each homologous series I'll be introducing you to what the general formula for that would be. Um, those formulae there, these ones with every single bond drawn, those formulae are displayed formula. So if you're asked to do displayed formula or structural formula, the structural formula just tell you how it's structured and the displayed formula must include every single covalent bond that you have. So they are displayed formula and they show you the structure and therefore you can call them structural formula as well. But I want you to learn that they are displayed formula. So homologous series have a trend in physical properties. What do we mean by physical properties? Well, we don't mean reactions. We mean things like their density, their weight, their volume, their diffusion rate, etc. And chemical properties, we mean reactions. So any homologous series will have chemical properties, will be similar. See that? Similar chem chemical properties there. Similar, similar chemical properties but what about physical properties? Well, physical properties like boiling temperature will change as the molecules get bigger and bigger and bigger. The boiling points will get more and more and more. And therefore, there is a trend. You need to use that word trend in physical properties. Uh, things like melting and boiling points. So let's just go through some of these common sense things. As the molecules get bigger, then melting points, boiling points get bigger. As the molecules get bigger, viscosity, that's th thick and gooey, thicky, thick and gooey, gooeyness increases, viscosity increases. The proper word is viscosity increases. As the molecules get bigger, the diffusion rate, if they're gases, diffusion rate gets less. The, the diffusion rate the diffusion rate of diffusion is slower with bigger molecules now those are physical properties whereas chemical properties are reactions you know how they burn how they react with bromine how they react with steam and water those kind of things they are physical uh, so they are chemical properties and the chemical properties of a homologous series are similar. Now, there are three reactions of alkanes. Alkanes, you can burn them. I'll show you one of those burning in a minute. Alkanes, you can crack them. Now, I have a previous YouTube video on cracking where I show you that being done and they do not react with bromine water if you shake them. This is important because this we use as a test to prove we've got double bonds present. And as you can see, in alkanes, no double bonds are present. If no double bonds are present, then when we do that last reaction, they do not react, they don't react with bromine water. However, there is um, an inclusion in certainly our specification that you're required to know about how bromine might react in sunlight. Uh, might seem a bit random to you, but it's in our syllabus, so we're going to, going to cover it. So what I've done is, how do you pupils best learn these things about alkanes? Well, I'm a big believer in mind maps, or, um, spider diagrams, whatever you like to call them. But I'm going to show you one, and I like to summarise one homologous series on one sheet of paper and that gives the way my mind thinks that gives me an overview and I'd like you to do the same and it's no good just using mine get out a piece of paper write alkanes in the middle and then do reactions out from the middle to draw for yourself your own mind map so this is it this is my mind map but you draw your own 
You put alkanes in the middle, alkanes. Then, burning. Burning or combustion. If something burns completely, you get carbon dioxide and water vapour. If something burns incompletely, as incomplete combustion, then you get poisonous carbon dioxide and water vapour, or you get carbon, which is soot, I'll show, I'll show you that, and water vapour, or you get carbon dioxide and water vapour. Now, incomplete combustion, when you haven't got enough oxygen, will give you a mixture of those three. All three reactions will happen when incom incomplete combustion is happening. But when complete combustion is happening, only one of them happens. Now, let me show you that now. Watch. So let's um, get down to this. Demonstration here. Pretty straightforward. Let's see if I can get a slightly better picture. Uh, no, you can't see the. Well, perhaps you can see it if I move back. Okay, Bunsen burner. Right, turn the gas on. Now, you guys should know that is methane. Now, methane, one carbon, meth, methane, ain for alkane. Methane, or pronounced up north, we call it methane. Then, methane burns. With the air hole closed, you see, with the air hole closed, that limits how much oxygen can get into the flame. With the air hole closed, that is not complete combustion. Incomplete combustion. With the air hole open, that is complete combustion. Look, with the air hole open, I don't know if you can see there, the air hole, if I put my finger over it, I'll get the yellow flame. If I get the finger away, the air goes in there, more air, feeds the burning of methane and makes it burn completely and when it burns completely I have this roaring flame right now let me show you something what reactions are happening well when that's going on when that is happening as opposed to that happening that is your orangey yellow flame and that is your roaring flame talk about the roaring flame when the roaring flame is happening there is no orangey yellow coloration now that's important observation for me to explain to you what's going on now Let's see if we can get you over onto this board here. Methane gas plus oxygen from the air gas makes the carbon turns with oxygen into carbon dioxide gas. The hydrogen with oxygen makes water and because the flame is hot, the water comes off as steam, water vapour. To balance it up, the four hydrogen you need a two there. And one carbon, one carbon. And four oxygens, we need a two here. This is complete, complete combustion. And when you've got complete combustion, you never have the orangey yellowness. The orangey yellowiness is caused by carbon. Now, let me show you that. Here, I've got a test tube. Well, it's a boiling tube. It's a big test tube. So, a boiling tube. I'm just going to put the boiling tube, which is a glass, clear glass, look, I'm going to put it over this orangey yellow flame and just turn it so that it collects whatever's coming off from that flame. 
And when I do that, lo and behold, I find that the boiling tube starts being covered with a solid that's black and blibber, no, that is soot. Teeny, teeny pieces of soot, teeny pieces of carbon are coming off that flame. And you can't see them. Those teeny pieces of soot glow. Those teeny pieces glowing gives you the orangey yellow flame. Look, that is soot. Don't know if you can see on my finger. Um, I can wipe it off. I can even get maybe a, a, a white rag and wipe it and show you that the, the white rag's got soot on it. There. So I want you to know that flames are sooty when they're orangey yellow. And they're sooty when they don't get enough oxygen. If there's enough oxygen, there, air hole open, there's no orangey yellowiness there. Proper, complete combustion where all of the fuel is burning always gives you a not orangey yellow flame. Where you've got incomplete combustion, like that, then you get soot, you get carbon solid. Now, as well as carbon solid, there's carbon dioxide coming off that flame. As well as that, well, let me show you car carbon solid first. Carbon solid being formed will be formed like this. So incomplete, incomplete combustion. Say you talk about methane, CH4, with oxygen makes carbon solid plus H2O. Right, to balance that up, one carbon, one carbon. Four hydrogens, we did a two there. Two oxygens, two oxygens, that's balanced. That is soot. That's what I collected on that boiling tube. So, incomplete combustion you get with limited air supply. Whereas you get complete combustion with um, plenty, plentiful air supply. When you've got incomplete combustion, then you will get if, if call that reaction one, call that reaction two. You will get both of those reactions happening, reaction one and reaction two. Now, there is a third reaction that I can't show you, but the third reaction is in between these two reactions. And the third reaction is where methane gas reacts with oxygen and the burn happens in a limited air supply and it will make not carbon soot, but carbon monoxide gas that has got that's got less oxygen in it that's got less oxygen the carbon monoxide has got less oxygen than carbon dioxide and to balance it up you'd have to have a one and a half there so methane gas with less oxygen one and a half rather than two one and a half oxygen makes carbon monoxide gas and carbon monoxide gas is poisonous. Now, I want to label that number three. In that yellowy orange flame, reactions one, two, and three are all happening. They're all happening at the same time in that flame. So, if you look at that, Carbon dioxide's coming off. Carbon monoxide's coming off. They're gases. Soot, carbon solid is coming off. And there's lots of water vapour coming off. I do have a previous video where I burn methane and I collect, I collect water vapour that's coming off the flame. 
and I bubble the carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide mixture, I bubble it through lime water and the lime water gives me a white precipitate. So if you want to look at a previous video where I do that, that's fine. That's burning of methane gas. But methane gas is just one alkane. The same thing would happen with other alkanes. So that, that is this here. Combustion. Burning. Complete. Gives you just carbon dioxide or water vapour. Incomplete gives you, that's reaction one. And these are the other two reactions I wrote on the board. So, incomplete combustion is not as simple as it may seem. It's all three reactions happening at the same time. And the main thing about incomplete combustion is this idea that you get carbon monoxide formed. Now, the, why is that the main thing? Well, it's the main thing because carbon monoxide is poisonous. And when we do class experiments and people put their Bunsen burners, a whole class with Bunsen burners on a yellow safety flame, then I start getting a headache after about four periods of that. It's because the carbon monoxide is tying up hemoglobin molecules inside me. Those hemoglobin molecules I need to transport oxygen. If I don't have enough hemoglobin molecules, then I can't transport oxygen to places like my brain that needs it, and I start feeling a headache. And that's the first symptom of carbon monoxide poisoning. Now, don't worry, small headache. When you stop breathing it in, you go into the open air, and fresh air, you breathe it in, your body will sort that out and you will recover fully. So I don't worry about it. But if you were to keep breathing in the carbon monoxide, then that would be dangerous and it can be fatal. If your body does not get enough oxygen, it can be fatal. So that, that's alkanes reacting in a burning reaction. This one, cracking, uh, that, if I take you back to fractional distillation of crude oil, the fractional distillation of crude oil gave you fractions. And I've got previous videos that deal with that. And then those fractions in the world are in different demands. The smaller fractions are much more in demand than the, the, um, the larger fractions are much less in demand. And so what this does, if you get large fractions and heat them up with zeolite catalyst, and in the laboratory we use porous pot, but in industry they use zeolite, which is a very similar thing. Zeolite's got holes in that the alkanes could go into and be heated really strongly. And when they're heated really strongly, they break into fragments, and the fragments are smaller alkanes. Now, one great thing about cracking is that as we do it, we get a mixture of alkanes and we get some alkenes. And the alkenes is our next homologous series, and you'll see that that, that is important too, and I, I need you to understand what's going on there as well. But for now, I need you to understand burning there, cracking here, and then I want to show you something here, which is this one here. Shake with bromine water, no reaction. Now, it seems a bit strange that I want to show you a, a, a non-reaction, but it's important to see non-reactions in the same way in the same way that you see reactions, you need to understand non-reactions. So, here I've got somewhere cyclohexane, cyclohexane. I've got cyclohexene. So I'm going to use cyclohexane now, and soon I'll be using cyclohexene to do this same test. Now this is really quite an important test. What it, if I can open it, what it does is it tests and proves the presence of a double bond. 
So here, cyclohexane, cyclohexane. Put the top up. Now, bromine water. Now, we have to be careful with this. I just want to pour some out into a, a little beaker. You can see there. Pour some of this bromine water out. Bromine is nasty, but bromine water is not so nasty. We put a few drops of bromine into water to make the bromine water. Do you see the colour? It's orange. Now watch. Alkanes with bromine water, shake it up, put my thumb over the top, give it a good shake. The colour remains, the bromine colour stays. Now that is no reaction. I suppose while I'm here I'm going to show you the reaction with an alkene. Now, when there's no reaction, when the bromine colour stays, when the bromine colour remains like this, then we know there's no carbon, double bond carbon. This is proof for a carbon, double bond carbon bond being present. Now, rather than saying carbon, double bond carbon bond being present, what I want to do is I want to use the term saturated and unsaturated. So saturated is when all the carbon-carbon bonds are single bonds and unsaturated is like cyclohexene. It's where there is at least one carbon double bond carbon bond present in the molecule. So that is cyclohexene and I'm going to do the same thing with bromine water, put a little bit in. See the colour? Shake it up. And the colour has gone. Now, only double bonds will react with bromine like that. Therefore, if the colour goes, we talk about decolorizing, decolorizing the bromine water, that proves you've got carbon double bond carbon present within the molecule. Now, these smell a bit, so I'm going to put these in the fume cupboard out of the way. While I talk to you more about what you need to know. So shake, shake with bromine water, no reaction. I want you to learn that alkanes will not decolorize bromine water. Alkenes will, and we'll get onto that on the next <coughs> mind map that I've got for alkenes. But this is alkanes. Right, then there's one final reaction you need, and that's this one. In sunlight. Now, <coughs> this, this was the Bromine and alkane not reacting. Now if I leave that in the sunlight, if I leave it in sunlight a couple of days, then the orange colour gets less and less and less. It's because with sunlight there is a reaction. And it's called a substitution reaction. Substitution is where one chemical will push out another chemical and take its place. It's just an English word. Substitution. We use it a lot in chemistry because here the bromine is substituting the hydrogen, taking its place. The hydrogen that falls out joins the other bromine and makes hydrogen bromide as a product. Sunlight will help that reaction to happen. Now, those four reactions are the reactions of alkanes. But there are so many reactions 
that don't happen. A bit like that one. These reactions don't happen. Indeed, the chemistry I want you to learn for alkanes is they largely unreactive. You know, we can burn them. We can crack them. They will react with sunlight. But besides those three reactions, they don't do much else. Indeed, at A-level, I want you to learn that they are a source of unreactive materials. We make plastics, etc., are big alkanes. They don't react with things. You know, you can put acids in them, alkalis in them, and they don't react. They just stay in the container, if it's a plastic container, because alkanes do not react. So I want you to learn the main thing about alkanes in terms of reactions is that they're not reactive. Um, in contrast to alkenes that are reactive. Let me just put this back. So let's get my, let's go on to the next homologous series. Next homologous series, alkenes. Now alkenes, can you see double bonds? Double bond, the double bonds make these molecules very, very, very reactive. The double bonds are a source of reactivity. Not only should you learn that alkenes in contrast to alkanes are very reactive, but they react by adding. There's an addition reaction rather than substitution reaction. Let me show you what I mean. Um, not sure I can, this is going to work, but let me just, just colour that in. Right. This is a substitution. Substitution is one molecule might come along, push out something that's there already, and take its place. That is substitution. In contrast, addition is where a molecule might come along and add on addition. So substitution reactions we have in chemistry, and you need to be able to identify them, but equally addition reactions we have in chemistry, and you need to be able to identify them. So these reactions of alkenes happen by addition reactions. Now, if I show you how that works in a minute here, I hope you can see that. I've tried to draw a carbon double on carbon. Four things sticking out of it. There could be hydrogens. If there were hydrogens, they would be ethene. If there were other things, it'd be something else. But what makes these reactions reactive is the double bonds flip open. And when a double bond one of the two bonds flips open, then there's one bond left. When one bond is left, how many other things are the carbons joined to? Well, that carbon joined to two others. That carbon joined to two others. And what I'm trying to show you is that when the double bond flips open, flips open and makes the prospect of new bonds there and there, then something can add on there. So say you've got X and Y molecule, the X and the Y can add on there. What I'm trying to say is, when the double bonds flip open, 
such that one bond breaks, that gives rise to two new covalent bonds there in blue being possible, which will add on, something can add on to the molecule that you had. So XY, I've just called it XY, but XY can be real chemicals. For example, XY could be hydrogen. And then XY there, that would be hydrogen and hydrogen. That would be turning an alkene, turning it into an alkane. And that's how we do it. We would react with hydrogen, the catalyst would be nickel catalyst, but we could do that. But what if it was water? H-O-H, -H. well then you get H-O-H. -H. And that would be an alcohol. And therefore you can get different products based on what you start with and what's going to add on. But the reactions are addition reactions and they are very common and they're very quick. As you saw with my bromine demonstration, if I just rub that up properly, bromine it would be Br bond Br. Now, ethene would be H, 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 H. Ethene and bromine, bromine water, would react together making a Br there and a Br there. It would, this would be called 1, 2 di hyphen there. 1, 2 hyphen di bromo ethane as a product and that one two dibromoethane product is an addition product it's an addition product formed when ethene reacts with bromine when we shake ethene with bromine we would get that that is colorless colorless whereas this here is orange bromine water is orange so you get this orange to colorless Orange to colourless colour change, and you only get that if there's a double bond present. The presence of the double bond is vital for such a reaction to happen. Remember, with alkanes, there was no reaction. You needed sunlight, and then you had to wait days. You couldn't just shake it up and expect to see a colour change straight away. So, back to the work we were doing. Alkenes. Now, physical properties, same thing. As the molecules get bigger, the melting points and boiling points of alkenes will equally get bigger. See, as the molecules become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, then there's more attractions between molecules because the surface areas are bigger, the attractions between the molecules get bigger and consequently you need higher temperatures to overcome those intermolecular forces of attraction. And another point is that the bigger the molecules, the more kinetic energy you need to give them to get them moving and to break them out of their solid structure or to give them enough energy to shoot out of the liquid to exist as a gas. Chemical properties. Now, chemical properties, they burn. You can do hydration. You can hydrate. Hydration is adding water. Addition of water is hydration. Hydrogenation. Hydrogenation is addition of hydrogen. Hydrogenation. Hydrogenation is adding hydrogen. Bromination. Bromination is adding bromine. Polymerization. Polymerization is turning these things into a polymer. Now, there's my diagram, my spider diagram. I want you to do this kind of thing. Look, alkenes double bond presence. These hydrogenation, hydration, bromination, those three are addition reactions. The addition reactions, hydrogen, hydrogen with nickel catalyst, will put those hydrogen across the double bond. Water vapour, 
We'll put H and OH across the double bond. Bromination, shake with bromine water. We'll put BR and BR across the double bond. This one is a way of making an alcohol, ethanol, which we'll talk about when we talk about fermentation as well. So you need to learn the conditions. The conditions for hydrogenation are nickel catalyst and hydrogen gas, of course. To get hydration, you need steam, steam at 300 degrees. You use concentrated sulfuric acid or concentrated phosphoric acid as catalyst. And you need a pressure of 65 atmospheres pressure. This is an industrial process that's carried out and it makes methylated spirits. So this process, hydrogenation, is used to make margarine. This process is used to make methylated spirits. This process is the test. When you shake with bromine water, that's a test for carbon, double on carbon being present. And then we've got normal burning. Burning is reaction with oxygen, loss of oxygen. You only get carbon dioxide and water vapor. With incomplete combustion, you get carbon dioxide and water vapor, and you get carbon monoxide and water vapor, and you get carbon solid and water vapor. That's the same idea that I was discussing with you when I was talking about the burning of al al the burning of alkanes when I was burning methane gas for you earlier. Right, I'll be wishing on for about 40 minutes. I'm going to stop there um, because I don't want the videos to be too long. I, I'd like to deal with this. Polymerization. Um, actually, let's, let's deal with it. Let's just carry on. Uh, I suppose if you want to watch the video, you can watch it in bits. Polymerization is where we start with the molecule and we make it react over and over again with itself and you should be familiar you should be familiar with the term monomer and polymer so i want you to just consider what happens if we have ethene ethene And what if we have lots of ethene? So N, where N is thousands. The ethene I'm building up to being a monomer. So monomer, mono means one, monomer means one molecule. Now that's one molecule, ethene. And we're talking about the number N, N, the number N means we've got lots of them, lots of individual single molecules. If you pressurize this, now, ethene is a gas. And when they first made ethene and they put it into gas canisters to transport around the country, they pressurized it. When they pressurized it, they got a white solid. And they say, oh my God, what's that white solid? Well, what happens when you pressurized it is that the double bonds open up into single bonds. And then they link with each other. So what we found was that you get really long molecules like this. That was your original ethene part of the molecule. Put a little end there. That, that end is thousands, and this is linking together. That the monomers link together and make really long polymers, and these polymers are long chain molecules. They're long molecules, and they're composed of monomers linked together. Now, if I was to demonstrate this, and I suppose it's too easy a demonstration, and I haven't got the paper clips, but if I start with a beaker full of paper clips, each paper clip representing a monomer, 
and I clip the paper clips together so the paper clips are adding to each other making a polymer that's the kind of reaction I want you to think is happening when this reaction is occurring and these reactions that make polymers are called polymerization reactions and this is the basis of a lot of our plastics that we have so this polymer is called poly A capital there, polyethene, polyethene, and the common name for polyethene the common name is polythene. Now, polythene is used in shopping bags. The bags you buy shopping, they are polythene. So, what if you start with? I'll do it that way. Let's try and make it nice and easy. CH3. How many carbons there? Three. Three carbons. Probe. Propene. If we were to do polymerization with propene monomers, we'd form a polymer that would be dot 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 dot. And the repeating pattern would be this propene thing that you started with which three hydrogens and one of them ch3 ch3 and that would be what repeats you'd need to be able to draw polymers and put brackets around the repeating unit and put a subscript n a subscript n like that on the right and on the left you need to Put in brackets and N in front. Remember the numbers in front multiply the whole of the structure, whereas when you have subscripted letters like that, subscripted numbers, they only multiply the bracket that's just before them. So there are a variety of polymers, like this one poly. Propene. Polypropene? Well, modern carpets are made of polypropene. Crates are made of polypropene. Rope, the blue rope I buy from B&Q that I tie things down with is made of polypropene. So, poly anything is this kind of reaction. Poly anything is monomers linking together. Now, in this section of alkenes, we deal with addition polymers. The addition polymers are polythene, polypropene, polystyrene, polyvinyl chloride PVC. They are your common plastics that are addition plastics. The reason you need to know they're addition plastics is addition plastics are not biodegradable. We are going to do a different type of making plastics called condensation polymerization. Condensation polymerization, that makes plastics that are biodegradable. There are questions at GCSE on biodegradability, and therefore you need to know that this kind of polymerization is addition polymerization. So back to that. Polymerization. What do you need to do it? Sometimes you need high pressure, sometimes you need high temperature, and sometimes you just need a catalyst. Um, I'm going to try and show you something. Right, so, I don't know if this is going to work because ideally I was going to nip out to the shops and buy one of those two-part glues like Araldite. Now, I forgot to do that. Instead, 
I'm going to have to make do with the chemicals that are in our store and hope that I can make it happen with those. So this is styrene. Styrene, I'm going to put it in here. Some people call this resin. When you buy it, in those kits, for example, for re repairing canoes, you buy it, it's called resin, and it smells. And styrene is an alkene. It's got carbon to one carbon bonds within every molecule. How do we make them break open? Well, if we use a little bit of catalyst, now the catalyst is dibenzoyl peroxide, which we're not allowed to use anymore. So I've got this out of the chemical store. And now I'm going to add this new catalyst. I don't think it works as well. But I've added it. Put the top on. Shake it up. That will, hopefully the catalyst, will cause the double bonds to flip open and the double bonds flip open then that the molecules are going to start reacting with each other making long molecules and that will become more and more viscous as the molecules get and grow within that sample bottle and all of these glues that you buy that are two-part glues like aerodite one of the tubes is like an alkene and the other tube has got hardener or catalyst in it. When you mix the two, then these kind of reactions happen. And when these kind of reactions happen, they make for you the plastic. Now that will take time to, to happen. Typically, in a class, I leave that about half an hour and then I break open the, the uh, sample bottle and there's a lump of plastic inside. Now that lump of plastic will be poly styrene believe it or not now polystyrene isn't the white uh, packaging material that you're familiar with that's expanded polystyrene this polystyrene will be a very tough solid material okay so um, if you've got glues then you make these kind of compounds these polymers when you mix the two-part glue together Right.